Greetings. <laughs> Should I put a little more growl into it? <laughs> okay, I came yeah. back to, we spent 48 hours making puppets. Uh, <laughs> making and breaking hearts, Ellinger. It's not that kind of podcast. On a practical level, <laughs> I have to remember what I was saying on a practical level. We should have a safe word. <laughs> Armageddon! I guess we're maybe semi-proud of that. Welcome to Hide and Create, your online writing workshop. All right, we are back with Hide and Create with Jordan Ellinger, Diana Roland, Moses Siragar, Joshua Esso, and John Klima. So we're talking about short story markets, and we are going to continue that this week. A couple things I think that we need to touch on are... For example, the steps that you might want to take when you're getting into a short story market, when you're thinking about submitting and getting your short stories out there. Um, probably the first step that you might want to do is create a goal for yourself, um, or maybe even more than one. Uh, but focus yourself in. What kind of stories do you want to write? Do you want to work in multiple genres, or do you want to work in just one genre? Make a list of your markets and um, make a further list of the markets in that list that are your favorites, the one that you really, really want to get into. Do you want to be in print or do you want to be published online? Uh, do you want to make as much money as possible or are you fine with non-paying markets because they're well-respected? Uh, as soon as you know uh, what you want, then you can actually go after it. And I'd like to suggest that you always set your sights as high as possible. Start at the top of your personal list and then work your way down. After you have figured out what you want to do, then I suppose the next step is to write a really awesome cover letter. Uh, after you've written your story, of course, we're taking for granted that you have a really cool story. <laughs> so write your cover letter uh, before you submit. Make it awesome, of course. And uh, I was wondering, John... What do you, at Electric Velocity, what do you expect in a cover letter? What do you require? So this is one of my answers that's going to uh, frustrate people. My opinion on cover letters is different from every other editor I know. Um, I would almost rather not have a cover letter if I could. I'm with you. I just, I'm, I'm there. I just want to see your story. Yeah. So <laughs> what I try to do, I want to see, you know, Dear John, not dear Gardner Desois or dear, you know, <laughs> I'd like it to be addressed to me. And then, you know, here, you know, attached is my science fiction story, Invasion of the Robots. It's about 4,500 words long. I look forward to hearing from you, Bob Ryder. Um, you know, I don't need your list of credits. I don't need uh, a blurb about your book. I don't need you to tell me to go buy your book, as I had someone do recently. Oh, no. um, so Wait, was that, I, that wasn't me, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I already have all your books. So. Okay, good. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people want to focus on different writing credits, and I'm, I'm not as good as I used to be, but I really work hard to keep up on all the markets. Um, so it's rare for someone to get to me where I don't know their name if they've been published in other places um it, it happens more often now than it used to but uh, i'm getting back and reading better than i used to uh, for a couple years there when when we first started having kids poor kids i'm blaming them for everything <laughs> um yeah I, I just remember I, I was on a panel at a world con and and uh having this conversation and the one person said well you need to list all your credits and i said i said if if you have writing credits i already know who you are and they looked at me and they said, oh, do you know this person? And I picked up the recent copy of Electric Philosophy and said, yeah, I have a story from him <laughs> in the new issue. So what? sort of a... Uh, That's a nice trick. Zing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very lucky. But, um, but I, think you, I think you have a really good point, though. It's like... It, it's the whole thing. If you have a good story, your credits don't matter, basically. And right. if you do have a lot of credits, they're going to know who you are anyway. But so that makes, I think that's a really good point. I, I think, you know, that's, that's both true and not true, right? Like when I, when I read a story, I don't look at the credits at all. We have an electronic submission system. So I go very mm -hmm. much on your first paragraph, right? If your first right. paragraph is awful, I generally won't read the rest of the, the rest of the story. But in print magazines, you have to remember that that those print magazines have the names of the pros on the outside, and I know that for Raygun Chronicles, the anthology that we're putting out, we're putting those names on the outside, and we have X number of slots 
for for new writers, right? And the reason you fantasy for good. There's a char- charity anthology that we've just recently launched. Um, I think we're going to have something like three to five slots for new writers, and the rest are all going to be reserved for writers that will be able to sell that anthology with their name, right? So, right. so if you're doing an electronic uh, magazine, then yeah, the story is all that counts. So my my thing when I submit a short story is I, I make I put the worst paragraph first, and it just gets progressively better, so that by the time the editor gets to the end, they're like, "Oh my god, it was so great!" So how saying, many short stories have you sold? No. I, I guess I haven't really done that yet. Um, that that's fine if your if your worst paragraph is great. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the things that uh, someone pointed this out to me, and and. You know, I always, I'm one of the big proponents of, you know, start with a good hook. The problem is that can't be the entirety of your story. You can't have a great hook and then 10 pages of junk. You know, you have to have 10 pages of great hook. So, you know, but I still see lots of things where it's such a slow build up. You're not writing a novel. You're writing a short story. You got to get me, my attention right away. I know he's you, talking about my story right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Ugh. So. No, I'm never talking. If if you think I'm talking about you, it's it's not you, dear. Yeah, that's nice. Um, so you, you just you need to start off right away and, and kind of pull the reader in, but you can't then stop telling a good story after you've got that great hook. So while it's it's fine to tell people you need a good opening hook, you also need a good middle section hook and a good end hook. Because otherwise, you know, I read this great opening and then I go, oh, wah, wah, that was sad. Uh, and it's, do and then I've invested. those noises while you're reading? I do. I have a horn <laughs> next to me. Um, <laughs> and, and that's almost more frustrating than something that has an awful opening hook. Then I don't have to read much of it and I can move on to the next thing. Something that's got a great hook, often you'll read to the end because you, it has such promise at the start. And then it becomes clear that this person has worked really hard at the beginning of their story. Uh, and they haven't put that much effort into the rest of it. So they've got the talent. So then you can send them a rejection and say, you know, I, I tend to do very generic rejections, but occasionally we'll, I'll change it up and I'll say something like, you know, your opening was really strong. You know, so you, they know that they can do this. They can write. You just need to be strong all the way through your story. Hmm. You know, it's funny. I'm, uh, I'm actually uh, at Writers of the Future this week and, um, you know, I know that their program, when you submit to them, it, it automatically pulls out the first and last paragraph or first and last page, basically, of your mm-hmm. submission. So they read that first, right? They read, first of all, they read the first paragraph to make sure that you have a speculative fiction, that you have speculative, you know, content, um, because they've gotten cookie recipes and stuff before. But, <laughs> um, and then they also have the last section because of what you were saying, John, about having that kind of, can you <laughs> land the ending? So that's a, right. a lot more rare than people think. Definitely, uh, and that's the that's what you're looking for. And, and um, John Joseph Adams put a post up recently where he, he talked about how he had edited some work. Uh, it's a really great post. I think it was up on the Ink Punks website and talked about the editorial process. Uh, and he got permission from the author and put up a lot of their conversations. But you tend to buy stuff for a publication that's pretty much publication ready. You know, it's it's more rare that you have a piece that needs work than you have a piece that's essentially ready with maybe a few little pieces to clean up. Um, so, you know, if your story's not strong all the way through, you're probably not going to make the cut. What is the what's the first thing that that'll turn you off the fastest, John? Is it the hooks and and not follow through or something else? Um I'm pretty cutthroat when I'm actually reading slush submissions. Um, and that's what I always tell writers. Like, you don't actually want me reading your slush submissions. You want me to be reading stuff that's been recommended by my readers because then I read the whole story. And my reader says, this is good. I'll read the whole story. But if I'm reading slush, you know, I might not make it past the first sentence. And some of that is just, you know, you've got to get me interested and I don't want to hear... I don't want to read something that's like a tracking shot in a TV show where we're walking past a bunch of stuff or, you know, descriptions of what someone's wearing or, um, you know, things need to be happening. 
I'm kind of like a magpie. I need shiny things to <laughs> grab my attention so I can I can move from one to the next. I think every editor is like that. Like you don't, you know, I mean, you don't read every story in a vacuum. You read like y- 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 twelve stories at a time, right? And by that, oh, no, that I, twelve I, story. I, 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 I read in outer space. Actually, <laughs> yeah. that's that's true. Um, but yeah, no. By by that by that twelfth story, <laughs> you know, you just you know, especially if the other eleven have been awful, which which happens, right? You're mm-hmm. you know, you you need something. So you, you're you're looking at that and saying, come on, something happened, something happened. And, and if you're tired and you're frustrated, unless there's something that's really good, you're going to be like, oh, well, here's another kind of so-so story, right? Right. So. Yeah, a lot of uh, stories will very nicely decorate the trash bin. <laughs> uh, that was that reminded me about uh, if you are going to write a nice, pretty cover letter, don't make it too pretty. <laughs> we don't actually yeah. need different colors and uh, and all this. Avoid the three C's, which are uh, cute, casual, and colloquial. So there's also a secret force, fourth C, which is colorful. But so no pink paper, no purple fonts. Uh, no matter how pretty you think it is, it's not going to make it stand out more, or it'll just guarantee that it's going to stand out wonderfully in the trash can, right? Yeah, it'll, it'll stand out in the wrong ways, mm-hmm. right? Speaking of uh, that's one of the things on. I like about our submission system is that I don't actually see a cute cover letter. You know, someone has to type in the cover letter or cut and paste the cover cover letter into our submission system. So if they've got it formatted all funky, I don't see that because it just comes in as straight text. Oh, huh. Um, speaking of uh, what we were speaking of, <laughs> um, uh, do you have any um, kind of favorite, like like pet peeves in terms of the actual writing itself? Do you have any phrases that you see come up a lot? For me, it's... Uh, Emerald eyes. Like, if, if I have to read one more, usually woman, with emerald eyes. Like, oh god, there are other colors, people. Do you do you do you have any of those? Or? <laughs> I had for some reason a couple of years ago. I had people mistaking the word shutter with the letter T as in Tom with the word shutter with D as in dog. That's so weird. I get that all the time, too. <laughs> where where they mean to use shutter with D as a dog, like I'm scared, yeah. hmm. but they shutter like they're at a window <laughs> closing it. That is uh, and so I, strange. I saw those a lot, and I got so frustrated with them. I actually had it in my guidelines. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you did that, you were being rejected, and it, it, it calmed down, so I don't have that anymore. But I'm sure people were like, find and replace in their manuscript after reading it. <laughs> Thank goodness people actually read your submission guidelines. We don't we have many people that don't read submission guidelines. They just throw us whatever, right? Yeah, I, I get a lot of stories that clearly are, are from people who have not read what we do. You know, I'll get I don't get a lot of it, but I'll get outright horror, which is something that we don't do. Um, real hard science fiction, which I don't do either. You know, I'll get stories about some guy repairing a, an engine on a spaceship and I just think, you know, this isn't what we do. If you looked at all, you'd see there's nothing. You know, I have stories about people who drink strange wine and end up in another universe, and then they get lost coming home. I mean, you know, it's not the same thing. Um, (laughs) You mean that's not the same thing as repairing an engine block? (laughs) Yeah. If you're going to do an engine block story, you got to have something weird happening in it. (laughs) (laughs) What are you about to say, Jordan? No, no, that's, that was, that was my question. You know, I mean, I was going to say that, uh, anything that gets you auto-rejected, but I think John answered that with the shutter question. Oh, oh yeah. The, the big thing right now is the, the lack of contact information, which is, is, uh, it's more baffling than frustrating. I, I just don't know why you would think that would be appropriate to send off a story without your information on it. The only thing I can think is that it, with the automated thing, they must figure that it's absolutely attached to at all times. But uh, yeah, right. as you said, it's that, just that that should be one of those uh, things uh, on your in your manuscript itself. No matter what, you always have your contact information, upper left hand corner, blah blah blah. Right. But, when I'm in a kind mood, I, I have to assume these people are opening up their word processor and they just start writing. Mm. <laughs> They're not thinking about it as a submission or that there's a process or they don't even know that there's a procedure for how you do these things. Um, Perhaps it's funny. They, perhaps they think that your form you, that will uh, like automatically tag it with yeah. like you know their information, their email address, and so forth, and so they don't think that it has to actually be in the attachment. 
now our listeners will know that no matter who you would um, submit to, put your contact information. Unless it's right as of the future. <laughs> oh, that's a different, right. right. <laughs> Everyone else, though. Joshua, can we link to William Shen's um, manuscript formatting t- template in the in the posting for this podcast? Yeah, that'd be easy. Because that's what I use. You know, like professional writers have a certain format in, in their submissions. And I think that William Shen suggests Courier New... And that's what I generally use, but many ma- many magazines these days want Times New Roman. Yeah, in terms of I, I use Times New Roman because yeah. that's what my publisher wants. Yeah, exactly. And so yeah, yeah. If if people specify, you should do what they specify. Yeah, you shouldn't argue with the editor as to what you think of the typeface they choose. You should just use the typeface that you they ask for, or go to another market. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> Lucida handwriting. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there was an awful Comic Sans uh, episode early on Electric Philosophy that I regret these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's a collector's edition, though. Yes. Um, yeah, I try to tell people, think of it like a job interview. You know, if the job interview said, you know, show up at 10 a.m. in a suit and tie, you don't show up at 11 a.m. in your shorts if you really expect to get the job. Um, you know, so if I ask you to use Courier New 11 point then that's what you should use. And technically, if you don't use that, I could reject your story. Now, I'm not that much of a curmudgeon. Um, as long as I can read it, I'll read it. But uh, sometimes we get things that are um, like one long paragraph uh, wow. you know, for 10 pages, and you think, what have you ever read like this? <laughs> like, well, my point, when, when, uh, people, when I uh, was talking about... Um, uh, submitting to agents. Every agent has different submission guidelines, and I've always stressed you follow the guidelines for that particular agent. And the reason is because when they're going through slush, they're basically doing you a favor, um, and this is how they deal with it most easily. This is what makes it easiest for them to read through everything and get through all the slush. Uh, and so, yeah, you want it to be as easy for them as possible. You don't want to put another uh, step in their way because then that just makes it that much easier for them to go, screw it, it's not worth the trouble. Yeah, I think Nick Nick Momtas has a has an analogy that I'm going to just kind of expand upon. Um, like imagine that you're a vendor and you're selling oranges because, I mean, that's what writers really are. They're vendors and mm-hmm. editors are customers, right? So imagine that instead of selling stories to your customers, you're selling oranges, right? And your orange might be the tastiest orange out there. Like it's just, oh, you, you, you bite into it. The, the juices are everywhere. It's just, it's just your taste buds are thrilled. But if it looks awful, like if, if the, the peel is kind of like a disgusting green and maybe a little bit of mold on it or something like that, no one is ever going to get a bite into that orange, right? No one's going to go after it. So your job as an orange vendor is to make sure that your orange looks really great so that people want to bite into it and get that that juicy inside. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Moses, I think that you have something that you wanted to say, right? My hand is raised. Uh, John, uh, when you were talking about that, that story of the guy who's really great at it and you never find out what it is. It just made, made me want to ask you, uh, do you have any other favorite or memorable or stories that come to mind that you've published in the last two, three years, uh, with, you know, maybe a short version of what it was about? Um, oh, and I don't know how to pronounce her name. Um, Megan K will call her, um, <laughs> published in issue 24 last year, a story called the night we drank cold wine, uh, is absolutely beautiful. It's one of my favorite stories that I've published. Um, and it's, I talked before, it's a story about a couple of uh, the family, the man's family makes this yellow wine and he takes this girl out on a date and they drink the yellow wine and they go somewhere else. Um, and it's not a very long story, so I can't give a lot more details than that, but it's, it's very beautifully written. Um, Megan is, a at least the stuff that I've seen from her, it, it's it's paced slowly, but it still gets your attention from the beginning. So that's the trick. You know, you don't have to be frenetic and shiny, but you have to be interesting. Um, Ken Liu's story, I take that back. Megan's story was in issue 25. Ken Liu's story in issue 24 was difficult to format. Huh. And I'll leave it at that. If you go look at it, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. Uh, in a print magazine, it's a piece of cake. Really easy to do. Online and in an ebook, it presented different challenges. Um, but it, 
to I think we did a good job of maintaining the necessary formatting to make the story work. Um, oh, what else? And I guess the another story from issue twenty five, uh, Damian Walters Grintalis has a story called Glass Boxes and Clockwork Gods, which is probably the closest to horror that I'll publish. Um, and it's it reminded me a lot of the movie nine, mm. the one with the little doll figures. Oh yeah, yeah, animated. Um, but but not that at all. But you might now that I've said that, I'll, that'll be in your head if you go read it. But um, you know, it's it's post apocalyptic. Things have gone south for the humans, and these sort of godlike creatures are playing with us as they want to. So there's a couple pieces from last year. We've got uh, we've got a story coming out in the new issue called The Irish Astronaut. Again, The Irish Astronaut, which is just gorgeous. Uh, it's a writer that I haven't seen anywhere else. She lives and works in Ireland. The movies, the movie, publishing movies now. The story <laughs> is set in Ireland, and it just feels like Ireland, and the the language is just so lush and rich. Um and again, it's another slow-paced story. So some of the stories I've liked best that I've published are slow-paced, which is odd because I tend to try to push people to get the story going. Um, but if you're interesting from the get-go, you can be slow. And so tell me where I can go again to get these uh, issues and also subscribe electronically. If you go to electricvelocipede.com, um, that's E L E C T R I C V E L O C I P E D E dot com. You'll be able to see um, the last three issues are online electronically, um, and you'll be able to see table of contents and things from all the previous issues. Uh, Waitlistbooks dot com is the ebook store for Small Beer Press. Uh, from there, you can buy back issues and current issues in a variety of formats. You can also subscribe to Electric Velocipede. And um, if you are a Kindle owner or a Nook owner, you can go to your Amazon store or your Barnes & Noble store and get the last couple issues for your Kindle or your Nook, as well as forthcoming issues as they come out. Great. Thank you. I'm going to do that. Some of those stories sound pretty awesome. Yeah, ditto. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, the one that you told us about last week with uh, the things that he does or the way he does – what was the title again? The way, he, the way He Does It by Jeffrey Ford. That one's just he... online. It was actually reprinted in uh, Jeff's story collection, The Drowned Life, which came out from Knopf or William Morrow. So I've had a story appear from a major New York publisher that was originally published in – uh, Electric Velocity. That's awesome. Sweet. Which is pretty cool. Jeff Ford is just one of my favorite short fiction writers. So we're getting real close on time, but before we have our final thoughts, I'd like to ask one more question um, about wait time. I know that in many markets that you submit in, you're going to be waiting for a month at least, most likely many more than that. Uh, I was wondering, John, what is the wait time right now over at your magazine? We've, <laughs> for rejected work, um, <laughs> we've been having a turnaround time of probably three to five days. Um, for work that gets recommended, uh, then you kind of hit the log jam that is me um, and all <laughs> my time and all the needs that I have and things I need to do. So um, I believe that... I still have stuff from late November, early December in there. Um, but I try to, I really work to keep in touch with people and, and I have people that I tell them feel free to contact me and get in touch and ask me questions. And if someone is tired of waiting, I'm more than happy to let a story go and let, uh, let it go onto another market. I, I don't want to have your story in, uh, sort of kidnapped in my system. Mm. So I want you to be able to do what you need to do with your story. If you want to take it to another market, that's fine. Uh, but I was going to say, but you don't like simultaneous submissions. Is that right? I, I 
don't prefer them. Um, people certainly can do that. And then the, my only question is, or my only rec- uh, requirement is if you do that to either let me know up front, um, or if it gets accepted somewhere else, let me know right away. Um, mm-hmm. And, and if that works for people, if that's how they want to do things, um, and that's how they, they want to send their stories out, I'm at least willing to, to take a look at those things because I know I'm a little slower than some places. I know that Clark's World has probably a three day turnaround at its longest, um, for everything. Uh, light speed is, is probably a similar amount of time. So, uh, you know, these places have a fast turnaround, so I don't want to be the guy who's got your story for seven months. And, you know, then th- that's what happens. We were talking before, like you sit and read 12 stories at once. So then I'll, I'll have a chunk of time and I'll sit down. Okay. I'm going to, I got to get through these stories and, uh, get responses off to these people. See, like December's, that's not bad to me. You know, like, I mean, I, I was in the slush pile of a certain Canadian short fiction magazine for 460 days and that I think is insulting to writers oh. that's just, that's ridiculous. and I know there's a rather large market that, that we've named on this show that has those kind of wait times too and I would I would literally never never submit to those markets because I think that's just disrespectful um, especially for short fiction yeah 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 exactly but I think you know like seven months even I think is, is, is reasonable right you know like Everyday fiction has a wait time of, of 90 days, right? But we have a, you know, it's flash fiction, so we can generally count through those stories pretty quick. But December, yeah, so November. The oldest, yeah. the oldest story that I have is from December 10th. Yes, yeah, so that's not bad at all. I mean, it's just April now, right? So. Yeah. Do, you, do you treat your, those, those submissions that, they say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm simultaneously submitting this elsewhere. Do you, do you, cause I, you know, you see that sometimes where editors are like, okay, sure, as long as you tell us up front. Do you treat that, you know, even a little bit different? Like, are you like, well, you know. No, no, I can't, cause I can't say I'm okay with it and then give them the short end of the stick. I don't think that's right to do. If I'm gonna say you can do simultaneous submissions, then I can't say, well, we'll just reject those. Cause then I should just say don't do it. Mm. So. <laughs> You know, the, the thing that happens to me is, is something's on simultaneous, simultaneous submission that gets recommended by one of the readers and it takes me a little longer to get to those. And then it, in the meantime, it gets accepted by this other publication. And sometimes the timing of the message from the writer and when I get to the story don't match up and I'll have just read the story and then I get the email saying, oh, this was accepted somewhere else and you think, why didn't you tell me yesterday? But you know, yeah. Yeah, like, you know, my time. You know, we don't we don't allow simultaneous submissions in everyday fiction because you know we have three or four readers look at it and they all uh, give you personalized feedback on your stories, right? And I and I think, well, God, you know, like we're just about to accept something and it's been published elsewhere. Why why did we waste our time, <laughs> right? You know, again, yeah. it's the yeah. the customer vendor. Um, uh, analogy, right? You know, we're your customer, and you have offered something to sell to sell for us, and we're like, yes, we want to buy this, and you're like, well, no, I sold it to this other dude, right? That kind of, you know, that, that, that's not a good good place to be. So, for all you writers out there, a way around this, a good way to get uh, around the wait times is to write a lot and submit all the time, so you have a steady stream of things going out. Absolutely. That way you don't have to wait. Yeah. Someone like Ray Bradbury was always working on about a dozen stories at a time. And he would write a story and then he would make himself have it sit for four to six months before he went back and looked at it again. And that way, in his mind, he always had something out. So every market always had a Ray Bradbury story on submission. And and that's the way he worked out. Unfortunately, most of us can't write like Ray Bradbury. But, (laughs) you know... You kind of can do something similar where if, if you can write at that volume, you can get stuff out there. I've got a story at that place. I've got another story at this place. And then you'll start getting, um, hopefully you just get all those acceptances is back and you're like, <laughs> wow, now I need to find more markets for my stories. Um, but yeah, you, you write a lot and send it out a lot. I'd like to have a uh, final thought because I think we're probably running long here. John, you're just so awesome you're filling our show with just too much of it um moses 
do you have any final thoughts, final questions? Uh, I'm going to say no. I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you, John. Thank you for being on our show. And I will pass it back to Josh. <laughs> and I'll pass it to Jordan. Uh, where do you keep your Hugo, John? <laughs> it's sitting behind me in my office here at the library. There we go. That's my final thought. <laughs> I, I was just I was just gesturing to it because you can see me. <laughs> of course. Oh, yes. There you go. Best, and, best, best editor short form, is that what that's for? That was for best fanzine, actually, which okay. uh, caused a little bit of a uh, an uproar because uh, I wasn't what was traditionally considered a fanzine. Uh, uh, and, and I didn't quite understand the distinction at the time. Um and uh, I actually have talked to some of the other people who, like Chris Garcia and uh, uh, people who have been up for best uh, fanzine and uh, kind of commiserated on, you know, Chris, Chris's comment to me was, well, they're doing great stuff. He's like, it's not like what we're doing where we're writing, you know, fan articles about things, but he's doing great stuff. He's doing good things. So that was, that was great to hear Chris say that. So, um I don't know. I'm not giving it back. So. <laughs> 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 Mine. <laughs> uh, and saving the best for last, Diana, what are your <laughs> final thoughts? Uh, I have known John for a while and have known him to be a very wonderful, gracious man, and that opinion is simply being confirmed. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Love fest. Your, your check's coming in the mail. <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, last thing. <laughs> You've got to tell us, where did the name Electric Velocipede come from? Um, I was trying to think of a name for uh, my magazine uh, after I had left publishing. I was in another industry, and I was going to use the word patina as a cover, uh, as a title. And then I found out that someone I had worked with had had a... a sort of a fanzine in the 70s and 80s called Patina. And I thought, okay, well, let me think of something else. So my wife and I were just bouncing words and ideas back and forth, and we're kind of giggling and laughing about it. And uh, her dad, my father-in-law, often calls it bicycle a velocipede. So I was, I was in the mood of trying to stick two odd words together and see what they sounded like. And I said, electric velocipede. And we kind of stopped and looked at each other and said, oh, that might work. Let's <laughs> have a ring to it. Love it. Yeah. Or for a Seattle garage band. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, John. We really, really appreciate your time. And that has been this week's episode of Hide and Create. Please join us next time with Lies Writers Tell Themselves. This has been another episode of Hide and Create. The show is produced by me, Jordan Ellinger. The site is edited by Joshua Esso. And your co-hosts have been Diana Rowland and Moses Sergar. That music that you're listening to was written by Jason Donnelly. We can be reached at writingpodcastonline.com, where you can ask us questions and suggest topics for future shows. Thank you for listening. Now go hide and create something.